we generally uh, have a slow start a little bit. So we'll kind of just um, maybe do check-ins around to start us off while people are um, coming online. We'll give them a few minutes. So for check-in, we'll use mutual invitation so that we're not all like in Zoom land, like going, who's going to say speak next, right? So mutual invitation is an invitation for the next speaker after you speak. So you designate the next person and they can respond. And always the options are pass, um, which means... Uh, don't come back to me. I don't want to talk tonight. I'm just here, right? Or pass for now, which means I need to think about uh, what I want to say for check-in. So um, let's just uh, offer our names, where we're at, King County or Echo Glen, and some place that you have found joy recently. So I'm Terry. I'm at both places, and uh, I, I'm going to say I found joy on a date night with my husband last night. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to invite Christian. Hi, I'm Christian Carey. And let's see, I found joy... I found joy, this is going to sound self-serving, I found joy at Echo Glen on Monday, hanging with uh, my mentee, who's uh, going to be meeting with uh, an IT professional to learn what it's like to be in the IT field. And he seems so receptive and open and enthusiastic. So that's the last time I felt a great deal of joy. Okay. Um, I'll pick Brooke. Hi, um, my name is Brooke. Let's see, um, I served at Echo Glen um, as a mentor and then also um, I work at the Echo Glen School as a paraeducator. Um, so we've been back to school the last couple of weeks. I would say my moment of joy um, I got to see some of my old students that I haven't seen since last school year, since school starting up again, um, and just seeing them come into the classroom and like being so excited to learn and saying that they're excited for school, which is really huge for these kids. So that was a moment of joy. Nope. All right, I, I'll uh, pick someone since Rick got cut off. And how about Tiffany? Hi everyone, I'm Tiffany. I serve at King County Juvenile and uh, where I found a moment of joy this week, um, I have to say in motivating two teams. So in, in the work that I do, it has to do with people suffering from addiction, homelessness, things like that. So it's tough, right? So I had the opportunity to give devotion and encourage a team that's pretty disheartened right now. And I found a lot of joy in, in doing that. So. I am going to pass to uh, Nick. All right. Uh, I am Nick. My pronouns are he and him, and I work at Echo Glen Children's Center. Uh, I recognize some faces in here. Um, the recent joy I found, I think, was getting back after the last COVID outbreak to do the sweat lodge with our native volunteers this past weekend and seeing the kids. Oh, and I will pass it on to Jojo. Uh, we can't hear you, Jojo. You didn't look muted, but. It's all part of the plan. Still can't hear you. You'll be our silent partner for a while. You can type your intro into the comments. <laughs> and uh, let's see, uh, Jeff and Michelle, would you like to share? 
Hi, we're Jeff and Michelle. We uh, serve, I uh, guess, as uh, religious mentors with Jehovah's Witnesses. And I think our joy has been that we were able to have a family from Russia stay in our home for four weeks while they were trying to get their feet on the ground. As they were, uh, I'm not sure if everyone knows, but our organization is being completely persecuted. In Russia, they have seized all of our buildings all of our facilities, and if you use a, a Bible in talking to someone, you will go to jail and you will be incarcerated. And so for that reason, many witnesses in Russia are fleeing. And so this family came to stay with us for four weeks while they were getting, uh, they said their feet on the ground and now they're out staying with some family members in Snohomish. So and their children are being taken away. And, from the, yeah, and they take the children away as well. So it's, Just it's, three it's really brutal. And so that was our joy. Right. And let's see, I'm not sure who we can call on. Let's see, uh, Susan, have you? I don't think you have yet, have you? I know, sorry, I was late. Um, just got home from Echo Glen and that's where I serve. And um, let's see, as a chaplain, a Christian chaplain. And I... Um, I haven't had time to think about this joy thing, but I did meet up with an old friend that I used to work with yesterday and it was really great to catch up, so. Yeah. And we're uh, using mutual invitation. I think Sheila and Kimiko are the people that are left. Is Steve with you? Hi, this is Steve and Kimiko here. Uh, we have been doing um, what I since 2017, but since pandemic started, um, we didn't go. Um, but I really miss uh, those kids. I switched to Isaka School District mentor program, but they are very different from Echo Grand Children's Kids. So I really miss them. And um, I recently joined the Toastmasters Club. So I talked about Echo during the meeting. And um, I talked to uh, church people. So I thought maybe I can um, keep on talking about them. Um, but I really like those kids. At the first, I went there because I got the newsletter for the Isaka School District. They said they want to have a volunteer for the cooking and art. So I went there. I didn't know it was the Washington Juvenile Detention Center. So I went there at first. Oh my God, this is not the Children's Center. <laughs> and I'm really nervous at first, but after I started cooking class with them, I really liked them. I, I had really had a joy and I really enjoyed myself. And I realized that they look really cool, but inside they are very vulnerable and very sensitive. Um, I like teenagers and I really had a good time with them. So I'm always thinking about them. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Sheila? Okay, I'm Sheila Gay. I'm a volunteer through this chapel arrangement. And I think a moment of joy for me was this week being able to um, connect with a youth in one of the cottages um, regarding his Bible study program. And um, I went in with another of the volunteers that she's not able to be here tonight. She's having um, issues in her family. Um, but Jeff and I get to return in for a follow-up visit. And um, I, I just really um, agree with what Kim said about um, sometimes the, the youth are, are hard-edged on the outside, but really not. And that this, this one is, um, he's sensitive and soft on the inside too, and uh, just appreciates connecting and what we're trying to do. So that was a good day. And Rita, we were talking before, so I don't think you've done an actual intro to the big group, but I, I forgot you were because we talked individually. So if you would do an intro to the big group, that'd be great. Uh, we were talking beforehand, but um, I'm Rita Armagost and I know Sheila and Jeff and Michelle um, quite well. We worked together for years since 07 in Echo Glen, and it's been a, an, an incredible privilege over the years to work with these youth and see the growth 
and the spiritual growth particularly. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Okay. Tonight we have with us Nick Kushner from Echo Glen, who is going to teach us about gangs. I think some history, some cultural information, things that uh, even in our brief conversation the other day, I didn't uh, realize. So I think there will be lots of learning for all of us. So Nick, you wanna take the floor? Yes, hi. So I was very excited to come and talk to you guys. This is kind of a, it's a question we get a lot, honestly, whether it's from religious volunteers or any other types of volunteers. Um, and I will just preface this that I do usually present in the new employee orientation, but this is not usually my wheelhouse. My usual wheelhouse would be more in like managing the floor, coaching in the moment, and LGBTQ plus youth. So this is a little out of my wheelhouse. I had asked for uh, our training coordinator to actually join us tonight, uh, but unfortunately she's out sick today, so she couldn't. So a lot of these slides are I stole from her and she didn't give me any notes because she wants to keep the secret. So if you for at any point have any questions, uh, you might have to, I was playing with it. I've never done a screen share in uh, Zoom before, but um, you might have to just poke me on the, on the chat and I'll try to stop, so. Um, I will preface this. Um, so I've worked here at Echo for about five years in my service here at Echo Glen. Um, I've worked with kids for well over a decade um, in the private education sector before uh, coming here in Detroit, Michigan, um, then moving out here. Um, so there is, it's a very dynamic kind of, um, kind of topic to talk about. And it's not something that there is like one textbook on this is the rule about gangs. Um, so uh, some of this information may be out of date. It's something that's always constantly moving and pushing. Uh, and that is why the FBI and the Department of Justice have an entire division of a national gang task force that this is their entire job is to collect data and information and stuff like this. Um, my goal isn't in any way to get you to become gang experts. Uh, my goal is to hopefully help bridge some of the vocabulary gaps and maybe um, some understanding or empathy into why somebody might wanna join a gang so that you guys can better um, build a better rapport with your mentees or in your religious groups. That's really my goal. So, any questions before we start? No, okay. Uh, so let me get this going here, or at least try. Terry, you might have to be my sounding board if it's working or not. So uh, let's do this. Okay. Okay, I see clapping, so I'm gonna assume that we're on the right page here. Okay. Um, so again, these slides were stolen from our usual presentation. I did debrand them a little bit and change the color and update some slides that I could find. Um, so working with gang affiliated youth, um, today it's estimated that about 80, that number of Americans are gang members and about 8%. Um, about currently right now, I ran the numbers yesterday. So in our um, ACT system, which is our um, automated client tracking software that we use throughout JR, um, there is a section of, in there, this is mostly self-reported or information that we can pull from um, court records or documents that uh, indicate uh, youth involvement in their gangs. And it's something that we typically use for, um, unlike law enforcement, our job is um, rehabilitation. And so th that data, that information is used for us to tr help try to sculpt safe environments. But currently, about 30% of ECHO's residents self-report as members of a gang. Um, so um, I don't know where this title came from. So when a youth are, uh, they come in, they'll sit down with the counselor uh, on intake, and they'll go through uh, a lot of history. So if we have detention reports, sometimes we do, we don't. Uh, we'll go through that, any type of gang stuff during that. Um, we do find that most youth will be honest or overrepresent uh, based on the fact that they are proud of their affiliation and they feel that the need to tell people where they're from and who they represent. Um, as we often go through, it's sometimes hard to validate or verify the authenticity of someone's gang involvement, um, as we're gonna learn about a little bit later here. 
Um, so, and let me know if I'm going too fast. I know there's probably a lot more information on the slides and I can always slow it down. So. <clears throat> Nick? Um, yes. Would you be kind enough to increase the size of that for some uh, of us who can't see? <laughs> Thank you. I will try. Uh, that's not that's not it. Um, I think at the top, Nick, where it says display settings on the drop down. Oh, in Zoom or in Oh, I think we could possibly be looking at the wrong screen on your Are you looking at this screen? Well, I think we, we, uh, uh, you're looking at my presentation screen. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Presentation, yeah. There you go. Let me fix that. I apologize. No worries. Thank you. That's um, great. So you were looking at the preview of what what's coming up. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm trying to drag this over here and share that. So now you should be looking at my background. If we do. Nope, again. I think All right. um, so. My experience with uh, the my personal experience is sometimes it's just easier to work from the, the raw PowerPoint in Zoom rather than try to manage the different views that come up when you do a master view and all that. So if all right. you can just stay here, that would be sufficient, I think. Okay, I will do that. Um, so pretenders versus contenders, um, thinking about that. So, uh, and we're gonna talk again about this a little bit later, but. Uh, a lot of times when a youth, we are Echo Glen Children's Center, and in my five years here, I can probably give you the names of five real gang members on my hands, like confirmed actual gang members. And um, a lot of that goes back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs and coming into a new environment where you are scared, you don't know anybody. It's an environment, you're a first time offender or it's your first time at Echo. Um, a lot of time kids are looking for protection. They're looking for uh, camaraderie. They're looking for a group that they can instantly be recognized, like be recognized in and be accepted by. And so a lot of time we do get people that overrepresent their participation in gangs. Um, the dangerous flip side of that is a lot of times uh, for just about every gang, there is a opposite or op um, of that gang. And if you represent one and you end up in a cottage where it's the wrong gang, um, it does actually cause a lot more harm than good, um, both to their uh, progression and their treatment plan, as well as potentially not, but ho well, hopefully not, but potentially their, their physical safety as well. Um, so um, we can look back in their file, review police reports, co uh, code offenders, detention reports, gang files from the county of commitment um, or former ties to gang members. Uh, if a youth says they hang out or they are known gang affiliates, it's important to read between the lines as this could mean two things. Number one, they are affiliated but don't want to tell you the depth of their involvement. Or two, they have no confirmed ties themselves but associate with or have family members who are known gang members. So um, just like some of the most recent um, documentation on trauma, there is inherited, uh, inherited trauma and then there's also inherited gang life. Um, and these have been going on since the inception of gangs and the start of gangs coming to the state of Washington from like places like LA, uh, New York, Baltimore, and Chicago. Um, it was recently kind of coming up and coming right now in Washington state is uh, BDs and GDs, which is a predominantly Chicago-based gang um, that has kind of just really taken a lot of roots lately. Uh, if you can't beat them, then join them. Some youth become institutional gang members, meaning they will claim membership in order to fit in or be accepted. In some cases, they get protection from other peers. In other cases, some youth will be recruited or put on by a gang or set. Um, so we're gonna go again a little bit deeper. So there is a primary gang um, and I'm gonna try, I'm not trying to be fishy or wishy-washy, um, but we try not like uh, kind of, the same thing for like mass shooters, we try not to glorify any one particular gang. So when I use examples, we, we don't usually like, unless we're talking about specific instances, we're not talking about a specific gang because we don't want to give that gang any more notoriety or any more reason or drive to do what they're doing to continue to get more 
notoriety. But um, that being said, there are, um, do you think of it like an organizational chart? So you have like the brand, which would be like, let's just say Scripps, and then you would have underneath that like a set. So uh, here, that's like a offshoot or a different set of Crips. So you would have Hilltop Crips, for instance, or HTC, and then you would also have a Cougar Crips. And they're both Crips. So when you like ask somebody, it's like, oh, what, what do you rep? Oh, I rep Crips, but that's not their set. That's their that's their gang. So and then within the rank and file, sets typically war with each other over territory or over businesses. So it might be that like. Hilltop Crips are fight, actually fighting openly against Hoover Crips, and they'll they'll fight each other as if they're fighting blood. Uh, who is the primary opposite of Crips? Um, this can be highly problematic when you feel the need to put themselves in a position or having to prove their loyalty to become established. Loyalty is often demonstrated by performing violent acts to impress or prove themselves to a more established member. Initiation, so just the rite of passage of making entrance or accepted into a group of society are often expected to complete violent initiation acts to prove themselves and get put on. Um, typically in the, up to the 90s, you would see that as um, getting jumped in um, was the typical rite of passage that was kind of brought up in the media a lot. And that was when a bunch of gang, uh, gang members beat you uh, to prove their love or their loyalty to the gang when you would endure that. Um, quite frequently here in Washington State is being crimed in, so they're asking uh, young juveniles to go out and commit uh, aggravated felonies to prove their loyalty and their work to the gang instead. Uh, among adolescents in large cities, 65 to 80 per, uh, 85% of violent crime, of juvenile crime, is perpetuated by gang-affiliated youth. Okay, so why would a young person um, want to get involved in this type of life. Uh, risk factors, um, life events or experiences that associate with an increase in problem behaviors. Um, so this is what we were kind of talking about before. So um, we're kind of looking at, at two versions of it. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, from the um, uh, psychological side. And then from the sociological side, we are also looking at just uh, youth in crisis of trying to discover who their identities are. You know, um, we were talking in groups the other day with Joe Show and, and Terry, um, you know, like when I was 14 or 15 and I would, I really love, you know, like the Smashing Pumpkins and Nirvana and I wanted to be a Seattle, you know, punk rock kid wearing the flannel and I dressed a certain way, I talked a certain way, I listened to certain bands and that became my identity. Um, not because I necessarily came from the same socioeconomic backgrounds or had the same experience that some of our youth have, but because um, just in the natural progression of adolescence and finding my own identity and being comfortable with that, we can take perceived personas and apply that to ourselves. And then kind of based on what I've seen in the cottages, the more insecure you are about who you are as a person or unsure is usually the harder you rep to not be seen as vulnerable or to be seen as growing. Um, and that's usually a pretty tell uh, big sign that we have here in the cottages. So uh, typically the real gang members we have understand the situation they're in, they're here doing time for a crime. Their job or their mission is to serve their time, get back out so that they can be a use to the gang on the streets. Um, here at Echo or maybe perhaps in detention, depending on what detention you, you're involved in, um, a lot of times we will get those kids that are uh, insecure or scared or whatever X may be, and they will rep the hardest and defend the hardest against this words or any slight or disrespect that they perceive from anybody because it's a disrespect to their gang. They wrap their own self-identity into the reputation of their gang as who they are as a person. So ultimately they end up taking it personal and end up taking measures that uh, I believe to other people or even us, we would consider unreasonable. Um, so Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, large bottom is, um, oh man, that is a big word. I, I don't think I can say it, but then we come up to safety needs as far as throwing in for basic, social needs, self-esteem and self-actualization. Um, so starting at the basics for physiological needs would be protection, a place to stay uh, for kids that may be on the street, 
Um, I don't, you know, mom struggling by to get um, food on the table. So maybe extra money for food or groceries. Safety needs if you come from a neighborhood that uh, may be threatened by a rival gang or there's a lot of crime, uh, being a part of something bigger than yourself, um, which is where a lot of gangs were originally founded from. The idea of like a neighbor, neighborhood watch. Social needs, um, finding respect and admiration within your peer group and acceptance, uh, self-esteem, um, certainly see that at the street gang level of um, dressing a certain way, talking a certain way, having tattoos, um, where your self-esteem becomes kind of wrapped up in the persona of what the gang is. And then self-actualization of you know doing well. Um, kids are actually proud, I've had conversations, they're proud of the things they've done for the gangs or the changes they made to the gangs. And they're like contribution to what they gain has done. Okay, uh, so looking in at a system, I don't, this is, looks very complicated. I don't have the notes for this, but um, looking in different systems, micro, meso, and macro. Um, micro, uh, some reason would be like just individual with maybe the delinquency, aggravate, uh, aggression, violent victimization, uh, antisocial attitudes, desire for group rewards, status, identity, self-esteem, protection, companionship, substance abuse, lack of supervision, um, disorganized domestic violence, neglect, generational affiliations, lack of role models, and economic uh, uh, deprivation um, in the home are all risk factors to uh, on that micro in the home level of where someone might join a gang. Um, because also here at Echo Glen and more recently too, a lot of our residents are coming from places where they're couch surfing, they don't have permanent residency with their families. Um, they may be on the streets for a lot of the time and they have to do what they have to do to get by. Um, they may be victim, they may be coming from homes of domestic violence or be vic victims of sexual or domestic violence themselves. Um, and they're looking for protection so that um, they have that area to grow as people and, and just to have that basic personal safety. Uh, so mezzo would be community, um, high commitment to peers, exposed to gang affiliation peers, negative influences at school, poor academic performance, truancy, low educational aspirations, negatively labeled by teachers and authority figures, few role model and educational frustration, low attachment to school, learning disabilities, um, and then in the community, poverty, high residential mortality, high crime neighborhoods, presence of accountability to criminal activity, availability of drugs, alcohol, firearms, cultural norms, feeling unsafe in the neighborhood. Uh, and I definitely think that just institutional racism should also be included on there as well. Um, macro, unless it's on the next one. Um, public policy, um, so development, zoning regulations, resources, pricing, gas, food, medication, et cetera, employment laws, access to public benefits, um, social depictions, racism, there it is. Um, and culture. So. so looking at pros and cons as like what it is, because uh, most every kid that has ever I've ever worked with here that has either claimed gang affiliation or has proven gang affiliation, um, they are not they're not dumb about the life, as they say. They know that it typically ends in one or two ways. It's either in the penitentiary or in the ground. Um, but for them, a uh, big challenge for us as counselors and one of the major tenants of DBT and working with our RTM coordinator is to help build in protective factors and build in long-term goals. Um, I don't know how many kids I've ever talked to that they only see them, they don't believe they're gonna live past the age of 25. So it's a lot easier for them to justify the things they do, the risks they take when they are coming from the mindset of I'm not gonna make it so I have to get what I can when I can, and my life has to be as good as it is while it can be. So uh, some of the pros, financial security, safety in numbers, sense of connection, belonging, family, status, uh, part of something bigger, legacies, peers, shared value, loyalty, commitment to others, brotherhood, and male role model. Um, cons, incarceration, criminal record, danger, high risk, loss, death. Always having to prove yourself, putting those you love at risk, and never feeling completely safe. Um, for anybody who may have served, or based on my time, a lot of what we see for gang recruitment 
is also falls in line with uh, recruitment of how we how boot camps work. Pretty much, you give them a uniform, you give them a symbol, you give them an ethos um, or a creed, and um, it's very similar uh, to how gangs end up recruiting and going through the process as a little G. So research suggests that most youth who join a gang don't remain in the group for long. The average gang affiliation lasts about one to two years. Um, but for those who do stay embedded, uh, embedding in the gang and continuing to likely engage in delinquency is much more likely. Um, as legislation has changed, um, and our population has certainly changed over the last five years of the type of kids that are getting adjudicated and being sent to places like Echo Glen or King County. Um, we are definitely seeing a higher rise in uh, acute mental health than we have before. Um, so I would say that in my experience, there have been kids in, in my career that I'm thankful for that I met at a younger age and uh, eventually have found a way at an older age, either through goals or through self-actualization or even in just their negative experiences in the, in the gang culture who have seen a brighter future and do understand that like, oh, this is something I can't continue. Um, unfortunately, and one of the insidious things about gangs in a place like Echo Glen is because we deal with such acute mental health is once you get someone on the ideal of that, it's a lot harder to break that cycle for someone who doesn't trust adults or see it as something negative. Um, so those are the type of youth that would typically continue past that one or two years and uh, kind of consistently push the envelope. Uh, so what is our role? How do, you, how do we work with these youth? Uh, before I go on, I will say um, I was trying to think about changing some slides to put myself in the position of one of you guys coming to the cottage as a mentor and mentee, and I'm, I'm not exactly sure what those sessions look like. I can only give you advice based on my experience as a case manager at Echo Glen. Um, and so the one way I would look at it and kind of the grain of salt I would take with this training is it's not our place. I look at it as similar to, 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 to trauma. It's not my place to label or judge your trauma. Um, it's real to them, right? If you're working with someone with acute mental health, their gang affiliation, their identity is wrapped into that gang. It's real to them. So we can validate what we can. And then we can also like, we can validate those feelings of, I want to be belong. I want to belong to something. I want to feel safe. I want to have my needs met. I can validate all those things. I don't validate it's okay to go and rob people, you steal from your grandma, um, or beating somebody just because they're wearing the wrong color clothing on a specific block. Um, so just something to think about. Um, this is not meant for to train you to be super detectives in the gang world. It's just hopefully to give you a little bit of a knowledge and, and understanding of what it's like coming from that kind of background. And then again, ultimately, my goal is to have you guys have deeper relationships and rapport with your mentees and the people, the young people that you guys serve with here, and we are so appreciative of um, to help to help um, help them see a different path for themselves. Um, so some of the services we offer here is uh, FFT or functional family therapy, substance abuse treatment, and counseling and therapy groups. Um, okay, protective factors. These are all DBT kind of minded, so coping skills, coping ahead, uh, pro-social skills, helping, sharing, comforting, cooperating, uh, strength in communities, strength in family units, and uh, equity of services. So um, it's hard even for some times in the culture of, uh, and we're going to get to the next section. This is more about halfway through, so please bear with me. Um, so um even for a gang member who has gone through a, like quite a road and has maybe changed um we try to put in coping skills or protective factors so for instance i was working with a young man um last year and he had a young daughter and he was a very a very religiously devout b was a very family oriented um but he also had a lot of respect to structures, and that was a big issue for him and his gang uh, on the east side of the state. Um, but I remember asking him one day of what, you know, his, what his goals were, and his goals were to be a good father, was to stay out of trouble. He wanted to be there for his daughter as she was growing up and not be locked up again. 
And so I asked, okay, just hypothetically, what happens if, you know, things are going south or, you know, your turf is in trouble and someone comes and knocks on the door and is like, hey, man, we need you to come out and help us tonight. And you're with your daughter. And he's like, well, they would never do that. They would just never do that. He couldn't even function that in his mind that he, because he has so much respect and love for the gang, he doesn't believe that the gang is ever going to ask that of him that that respect goes both ways, which is where a lot of things happen. It is a system set up to be manipulated. It is a system and an ethos set up to manipulate others from the top down. Uh, it is a system of oppression, um, even in its own little thing. Um, whether you're not smart, whether you're not ambitious, or whether you're a female in, the, in those environments, it is, at the end of the day, a system of oppression. Um, so other protective factors are strength in communities, whether that's through um, athletics, through school, uh, other community activities, community theater, after school program, um, strength in the family unit, and equity service. Okay, so the next section, we're going to talk about gang culture a little bit. Uh, are there any questions before we move on for anybody, or has anybody have anybody anything to feed? Because there may be people in this. This room, we certainly have staff that definitely know more than me with their own personal accounts of what it was like where they were growing up or where they were at. I'll make it big. Okay. So gangs, this is just comes from the definition from the Department of Justice. Uh, gangs are associations of three or more individuals who adopt a group identity in order to create an atmosphere of fear and intimidation. Gangs are typically organized along racial, ethnic, or political lines and employ common names, slogans, aliases, symbols, tattoos, styles of clothing, hairstyles, hand signals, or graffiti. The association's primary purpose is to engage in criminal activity and the use of violence or intimidation to further its criminal objectives and enhance its presence and association's power, reputation, or economic resources. Gangs are also organized to provide common defense of its members and interests from rival gangs, organizations, or to exercise control over a particular location or region. All right. Um, so when we're talking about gangs, so I was responsible for the second half of it, so I will be able to speak a little bit more about that. Um, so when we're talking about gangs, just kind of giving a brief overview of like what could be considered a gang and where it comes from. So gang is just another version of organized crime. And we've all seen hopefully The Godfather or movies like that. Um, you know, you got the Corleone family. So um, that starts on, so the way that Department of Justice breaks it down into two major major factions is organized crime, violent gang. Um, so they are either international organized crime and that could be uh, cartels out of Mexico, that could be the Russian mafia, that could be the Yakuza. Um, even the Italian or Sicilian mobs, and then infiltrated labor, labor unions, um, which is where a lot of uh, gangs kind of get their start. And then you have violent gangs, which are motorcycle, gang, uh, motorcycle gangs or MCs. I will say that not every MC is a gang. Not every gang is an MC, but when it comes to motorcycle gangs, the Department of Justice doesn't have a very positive view on any type of motorcycle club, so it's just a gang. Um, then you have prison gangs. Um, and these are typically gangs that have their historical start in prison. So, uh, for instance, Mexican Mafia um, isn't actually from Mexico. It's actually a, a prison gang that started in counties of L.A. and California. Uh, and then you have street gangs, which are the typical uh, Crips blood, stuff like that. All right, so at home here in Washington, um, we have our share of all structures of organized crime, prison gangs, and street gangs. Um, as you expect, these criminal organizations are traditionally structured in a hierarchy involving a figurehead and a rank structure under the two primary branches or arms. So you have the right arm, which is typically the more public face of the gang, and that's going to be the soldiers, that's going to be the enforcers, that's going to be the muscle. Um, they're the ones out there repping, they're the ones recruiting. And then you have the left arm, which is like Kind of broken down like Amazon. It's their financial side. It's their operations. They're the ones that are running the uh, actual criminal uh, criminal enterprises, um, and the right arm is there to protect the left arm. So that's the left arm is the money making side, and the right arm is the the muscle. Um, so fran franchising gangs. Um, 
So street gangs and prison gangs and even some MCs break down further as they have expanded over the years. Uh, gangs have typically shot up after World War II in areas of Chicago um, and typically along, along race lines uh, through the civil, civil rights movement as well uh, to protect um, those people of those communities from violence of people from outside the community. Um, so as that has grown over the years, or people go to different prisons, or people move around uh, through generational, we have like uh, Bloods and Crips that started out of LA are pretty much everywhere in the United States have a representation. Um, so um, and this is what we're talking about set. So Delta Crips and Hoover Crips, both are Crips, but have two very different sets. And actually, kind of uh, one of the terminologies you. Maybe you've seen the tagging here at Echo, or maybe you overheard a kid talk about it. They always like, everything's an acronym. Seems like state work for the military. Everything has an acronym. And so they talk about BK or CK, typically stands for blood killer, or crip killer. And those are designations given to people in the gang life who have killed people, those sets, right? Um, a lot of times there are, even within their own gangs uh, or sets, there are uh, this young man I was talking about, for instance, was very proud that he came from a set that was not CK. Like, despite all their differences they might have with other Crip sets, they would never go to direct violence and kill other Crips versus, and he looked down on other Crip sets that would, um, that they were less than him. So, historically, although there were other sets within the gang, there are typical dis um, direction or influence from leadership or code of conduct ethos or similarism shared between the sets. So most Crips um, use the blue flags um, or the blue color uh, in pretty much everything they do just because they're Crip and most Bloods will use the red, uh, whether they're Pyru or any other type of Blood. As gangs grew, um, there are more than 300 recognized street gangs in Washington State as of today. Um, as time passed, cities grew or gentrified and young generational and younger generational gang members are recruited or inherited. Gang culture evolved from its high structured organizations found in LA, the East Coast, and the Midwest. These changes paved the way for what is now referred to as hybrid gang. Hybrid gang culture is characterized by a mixed racial and ethnic participation within a single gang, participating in multiple gangs by a single individual, vague rules, codes of conduct, um, or gang members. Um, they use symbols and colors from multiple gangs. They collaborate by rival gangs and criminal activities, and the merger of smaller gangs into larger ones. Thus, hybrid gang customs are clearly distinguished from the practices of the predecessors. Um, this distinction typically makes gang activity more violent, less predictable, even in their own community. Um, Washington State is typically a hybrid gang area. Uh, we are not kind of known as like place parts of, I keep coming back to LA because it's the, the one in my mind that um, it didn't start here. Um, hybrid gangs we find are, are much more dangerous. There are rules um, in every gang and they have a set of ethos. They will not victimize people of their own community. They will not victimize people of, you know, family members of the gang. They will not victimize elder people. You know, they have a cult, some kind of moral typically attached to them. Uh, hybrid gangs don't have a structured leadership. They, off, uh, they operate similar to like what we see in ISIS or cell-based um, militia organizations where they have a general idea and they operate without direct oversight from any type of leadership um, to push the agenda of the gang. And that makes them a lot more dangerous, especially when a lot of the average gang member is probably 15 or 16 years old. So those decisions are getting made and about that, like when you're thinking at that level of thinking. Um, and that leads to a lot of, I would say probably, I didn't run the numbers today. I should have ran those numbers and I had them in this, but I would imagine that probably easily 50% of the um, incidents, the violent incidents we have here at Echo Glen are easily attributed to gang in some way, shape or form. Um, so this is going to take us into our last slide. So just these are the biggest gangs that we have here at Echo Glen. Um, blood, and you see them come and go, um, interestingly, um, over the years. So when I first started, Bloods and Crips were the top two. They were the big ones on the street. Um, then blood started to slip off. We don't get a whole lot of blood. Then we get a lot more Crips than we did. 
And then we started getting a lot more Norteño and Sereno uh, gang members. And then recently, over the last couple of years, um, GDs and BDs, uh, Gangster Disciples and Black Disciples, have also kind of become uh, a higher gang um, that we have here. So um, this is the end of my slide deck. I wasn't sure how much uh, you guys wanted questions as far as like symbolism or symbology or history in what gangs are or how to recognize it. Um, I assume on the floor that any hand signals I see and any staff I hope would just assume we are trying to be very strict on gangs, especially in uh, being a milieu based treatment center. Um, so our goal is pro social skills, teaching pro social skills and um pro-social ways of handling problems and opposition in their life and so we try to curb any type of gang behavior as best we can which means usually gang behavior is punished uh pretty severely um it, it's changed over the years but uh hand signals uh, pressing on other people um graffiti uh, color blocking, which is wearing, like, if you're a Crip or a Sereno, you're wearing as much blue as you possibly can. Um, Norteños, um, where typically the eagle, you see the eagle graffiti a lot around here as well. Um, and then we do offer here at Echo, um, you know, tattoo removal for those kids that do want to remove the tattoos that they currently have. Um, I also wanted to kind of leave it kind of vague for you guys because I'm hoping that any of this presentation or any of this conversation is not going to change your guys' opinions of what your kids have gone through, whether they're a mentor or a mentee. Um, I think the, the greatest service you guys do to these kids and the greatest service you guys do um, is treating them as humanly and empathetically as I've seen you guys do in chapel services or on the floor um, and seeing them for who the people that they are. Um, so that's, I do work with the kids to get them involved in a lot of different things and break down the walls that they typically construct around themselves of what they believe a gang member should be or how they should act. So just because you might be a member of Rolling 60 Crips doesn't mean that you don't enjoy classical music. Maybe, maybe you just have a jam, you love the violin and, or, you know, love photography, you know, so we constantly encourage them to branch out into things and express themselves. You can be a gang member, but at the same time, you can also be a support for your family. You can also be a good friend. So, any questions or any clarifying remarks? You can just popcorn it out. I know it's kind of a heavy, heavy topic. Susan? Yeah, so do you have any idea why they call themselves disciples, gangster disciples, black disciples? Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So um, they came from disciples. And if you notice, they used the six pointed star. They actually used the star of David and the tenants of star, the star of David. Uh, gangster disciples broke off from the black disciples and they came from uh, their founder was a, actually a preacher in the 1960s on the south side of Chicago. And so it actually broke off of that. And that's where the disciples kind of came from. So um, gangster disciples typically would add um, the trident there. Uh, it's not a, it's a bridge fork, um, and it, it varies. So um, you also have the peoples and the folk nation. So at some point there was a prison. I think in the 70s or early 80s there was a large prison, um, not a revolt but a protest about the conditions that were happening in Illinois penal system. Um, they were serving rotten food to inmates with maggots in it, and a lot of the gang members that were on the inside organized together to a sit-in, and those smaller gangs broke up into like folk nation, one nation of gangs, and the peoples that are their kind of opposition from people like um, like that. So um, that's why you see like, even though these are two very different gangs and they often rival with each other, their symbology is exactly the same because they come from similar roots. So, good question. Thank you, Susan. I have another question. Um, what about girls who um, don't necessarily identify as a gang member, but they belong to a gang member? So, yes, 
So the primary way of financing gangs is always going to be drugs or extortion, intimidation, um, basic robbery weapons, and unfortunately trafficking as well. Um, so depending from the gang or the set um, or just the leadership of where you're at, um, a lot of our young women are indoctrinated into the gang and abused through that uh, power structure. Uh, and it's typically a very misogynistic power structure that we see. Um, and they either end up uh, being affiliated, becoming an old lady, uh, belonging to another gang member, um, and often are acting. Uh, asked to perform sexual acts to prove themselves with multiple gang members and are seen as property of the gang, not necessarily a full-fledged gang member. Um, there are some gangs that are more progressive, <laughs> weirdly to say, um, where females do have full membership rights and they serve in your in. Um, specifically, actually, the Hispanic gangs typically have a lot more. Um, we see that a lot more in the Hispanic gangs than we do in the, the other gangs, the American gang. Um, but as we go through this hybrid gangs, a lot of what's currently accessible are the only real tenants, like they're, they're becoming progressive too. So they're, they're evolving into this hybrid gang and they use a lot of the symbology and maybe some of the ethos, but they've also expanded, um, as well. So I hope I answered your question, but, um, Typically, we do offer a lot of services for our female residents, as far as um, especially those being the victims of uh, sexual abuse, sexual trauma, or trafficking. So. Thank you. Christian, I saw your hand go up at one point. Oh, yeah. Um, let me see if I can articulate this well. So I, I have been working up until yesterday with a gang member. And I mean, you. you Whenever I introduced the idea of not being in the gang anymore, he kind of reacts. We have a very close relationship, but he kind of reacts saying, yeah, that's what everybody tells me, as, as if to say, please, just don't go there, kind of, kind of message. And so, if I, so then I have to back off, be a little less... Uh, telling them what to do, kind of, you know, get out of that mode of telling them what to do and, and, and make sure that I don't slip back into the mode of telling them what to do. Um, so I'm wondering, given that reality, what, as a mentor, what does my goal become? Am I trying to get him to leave the gang? Because I see Father Greg Boyle with Home um, Homeboy Industries doesn't seem like he's trying to get them to stop being gang members. Some some leave, but if they don't leave, okay, that's fine. So, what is my goal with these kids as a mentor who gets to see them only once a week, and all too soon they leave Echo Glen, and. Um, and how do I accomplish that? You mentioned help them set up long-term goals, which I thought it was great. You mentioned um, treat them like humans, which is good, but I don't feel like I'm, I don't know if I'm accomplishing anything tangible by doing that. Um, so what is my goal and what are some strategies besides helping them set long-term goals that you can recommend to us? Excellent. So if you think about it like the Marine Corps, and even when Marines get out, you're always a Marine, right? Um, part of the indoctrination of being in a gang is stripping away your identity as a person. So really what we're trying to do by identifying goals and building those rapports is try to kind of coax that person out on what their goals are, what their ambitions are, aside from the gang, right? It could be, you know, to be a D1 athlete, play basketball. Or it could be to travel. I want to travel to, you know, I want to see Sedona, Arizona. You're right. I want to see the Great Barrier Reef. Those are like little personal things that are outside of the gang. And we always try to hone in on stuff like that, right? Personalized, individualized goals that are outside of the gang structure or what the gang represents. And then we hope by building up those parts that they will self-actualize and understand that like, hey, the gang's really not working for me. At some point, it kind of flips to 
the gang is dragging me down, right? They get to a point, a higher level of thinking and being like, I'm doing so well, but constantly the gang is pulling me back and I'm, it's holding me down. That's typically where you get someone to leave the gang. So it's like trying to get someone to recover from drugs and alcohol. You can't tell them to do that. You can't necessarily force. It has Recovery has to be something that they want to do and that they're invested in. And so I appreciate your question, Christian. I wish there was a magic button and a magic wand. I was like, you're not in a gang anymore. And I, everybody has their own style. I, uh, and I would encourage you to find your own style and your voice, right? So I myself try to build a personal relationship with the kids, the, uh, the cottages that I work in, and I will tell them on, put it on front street, tell them I keep it hundred P with them. Um, do I think I'm going to save you from the gang? No, but my hope is I want you to live a long and fulfilling life and anything I can do to help, help you do that. I'm going to do that no matter what it is, right? um and so i when we talk about well i'm not gonna live past 25 well what if like let's talk about what you did like if you were to live past 25 what are some things you'd see for yourself what kind of job would you want to have would you have a family you know like what kind of family would you have you know what kind of place would you want to live in stuff like that and and start that vision in their mind and those goals so i think you're on the right track so and then if you do yeah and i think sometimes with a grain of salt, if you do have that um, rapport, that strong enough rapport with your kid, and then you could maybe start to like question the choices they're making. And I was like, well, that really seems like you did that because he said, you know, you said something or you did something because he disrespected your king. You know, and I know you really well, Christian. Why would you do that? That really seems to go against your personal value. Like you wouldn't do that. Why'd you do that? Well, I had to do that because I'm expected to because the gang, oh, well. But that's not who you are as a person, you know? And he's like, yeah, I would never do that. And that's like the kind of stuff that we work on, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Rita, I saw your hand up. No question. It was just an experience that I thought might aid some of the volunteers um, with a thinking. So uh, knowing that it is their security, the gang is their security, has a lot to do with this. But um, I had a volunteer that was joining us that had raised three boys, but she was very uncomfortable going in. And just one of the first few times we worked with this young man, um, he was actually not so young, he was 17. And I asked him, um, I had known him for quite some time, and I asked him if, uh, if we broke down on, uh, he was down in Military uh, Avenue, you know, down by SeaTac, his gang. And I said, if we broke down in the car and we're on the side of the road, we're waiting for AAA and you see us, what would you do? And he said, well, I know you, I'd come to your aid. And I said, what does that mean? You're not, that's not your gang territory. And he said, um, I would go gather my gang we would surround you and we would keep you safe until you could get help. And I said, that's at your peril then. And he said, yes, but you've helped us. You've been volunteers. You are not paid for what you're doing and so forth. But it made me appreciate the loyalty aspect um, of that they feel toward us as volunteers, um, knowing that we're there to help, knowing that we're there to give them um, a security that they cannot find anywhere but the gang at this point in their lives. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, kind of piggybacking on that and going back to Christian, I think another piece of advice, and again, this is your own personal value system. I'm not trying to tell you how to act, but there are, I didn't really go through the dis words or anything like that. There is pretty much a dis word for anything, a color means everything, and it's hard to keep track of. Um, if you're interested, through the FBI gang task force, they have a whole vocabulary section on there that's anything from, you know, Aryan Brotherhood to Latin Kings, it's all in there. But um, for instance, speaking of gangster disciples and, and black disciples, the trident, uh, fork is a pretty popular discord, but fork is a word that I use in my everyday life. Um, so I've had some gang members, I refuse to edit how I speak in my vocabulary because I want them to see me as an individual as well. Because when we're young or we're so wrapped up and entrenched in the gang life, they're, from their perspective, they would say, well, if you, if you actually cared about me, you would respect that this is going to be disrespectful if I hear that. 
And I was like, okay, I can understand that. But I also want you to know that I think you know me well enough that I'm a civilian. I'm not in the gang life. To me, a fork is a fork. So I can you trust me when I say fork that I'm not saying it in a disrespectful way or trying to be disrespectful to you, right? And they're like, oh, yeah, I see that. Um, and so those kids will jump on staff. They'll jump on other kids. Hey, man, don't say that. Bug is a pretty other one that they use a lot. Uh, vacuum is one for Hoover. Um, I think the big ones for like Nortenio and Serenio is like chap and scrap. Those are harder ones to use in the everyday vocabulary. Um, but um, stuff like that. And that's just my own coaching is it's all based on what your rapport is and what your personal value structure is and how comfortable you are with that resume. On where you go, but it has just come out um, that I have not got my hands on yet, but it's a meta study, meaning of mentors of incarcerated youth, meaning they have gathered all the studies together to do a meta analysis of best practices. So once I get my hands on that study. Um, I will distill it and share it out. I do know that um, in the in the kind of mentoring science within a juvenile detention um, environment, not like mentoring out, it's different. It's a different environment and it works differently. But just what you've been doing, which is the showing up in a compassionate listening way, um, crosses so many barriers and it does things that you're not even aware of just from a neuroscience um, standpoint because it's you you're doing something that other people haven't done in a way that hasn't been ever done and retraining just by being you it's a retraining his brain right and it may seem small right now but it's huge. That's a huge thing. You know, we're, listening to what you just said, I, I know that that's true. And I know that I'm building him up as a person and, and doing some healing. I can sense it. Where I struggle is, okay, that's great, but can I get him to leave the gang? <laughs> Yeah. And that's yeah. where I okay, how do I how do I do that one? <laughs> yeah, sometimes we have to um know what is more about us and what's more about them, right? So sometimes that's like our attachment. We don't want them to be involved in these structures that we know are oppressive and know are harmful, but we can't make that choice. We can just show up and ask smart questions, right? Think about asking those powerful questions that get to the why and cause reflection, like do that reflective moment. I had a question about um, the bloods and Nartenios versus like Kirp and Serenio, because I know that they use like red and then they both use blue. Are they related? Is that like totally different? And then also um, like the picture that you have for the bloods, there's like gang signs and stuff. Like what, can you talk a little bit more about like what that is and like what they look like? Yeah, so there is no official connection between um, the colors of bloods and Nortenios or Crips and Serenios. So um, Nortenios actually got their, depending on the history of the gang and what you want to believe, Nortenios actually started after Cesar Chavez and his revolution as we're in Hispanic Heritage Month this month, starting today. Uh, Cesar Chavez's um, workers' liberation and how migrant workers were treated, um, that eagle was actually the symbol of his labor movement um, that was kind of bastardized. It has 14 steps on it. The 14 is a number of Montaño, 13 is Sereno. Um, so they really kind of come out of like Northern California and parts of Mexican migrant workers. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's no correlation between blood, the color of bloods and Montenos or how blood picked their colors or didn't. Um, the thing about gang signs is, you know, um, and hand signals, there's, um, there is a lot and it varies from set to set. So there's no dictionary. Um, you can look at a couple things of some known signals, but 
as law enforcement documents, things change and shift or, um, you know, like the blood uh, B, like, you know, like the full blood thing or the three um, with the, the circle is kind of like the primary blood and then the crypt, as you saw on, um, you know, crypt C or crypt walk, stuff like that uh, for the crypts. So that's just kind of thing. Everybody's got their own kind of symbol. They, um, Gangster Disciples and Black Disciples actually use similar hand signals, the six point star. I don't know how to do with that. So uh, we just look out for handshakes and um, any kind of uh, signals like that and try to get to the root causes of what's going on with that. So, um, there's that. Uh, I don't know. Um, a gang member's colors, the bandanas are used by pretty much every predominant gang um, at a street gang level. Um, not necessarily an organized crime, but at street gang level. Um, and they refer to them as their flags, and that's kind of the symbol that's given to that gang member as a rite of passage. Um, so sometimes we will get uh, issues with disrespecting their flag, putting it on the ground or stuff like that. They will treat it as if it's a Bible. Um, so it's just kind of clues into what the indoctrination process is as far as getting the buy-in and their full con commitment of how they think um, of their game. So I hope that answered your question, um, at least part of it. There was a second part of your question, I thought, that I, oh, the hand signal, so colors and hand I think I answered them both, best I could. So uh, same thing as if you go to um, certain areas, the type of ball team hat you wear means something. You know, if you have a blue LA Dodgers hat, a black LA Dodgers hat, a red Angels hat, like those all mean something in specific neighborhoods um, that aren't known to the general public, right? In my area, uh, Florencia 13 has really been popping up on, I recognize the gang tagging, right? Um, that's been popping up in, in my neighborhood in blue spray paint. Um, I am aware that like in areas that you're Orange spray paint is kind of where you want to look out for. So orange spray paint, orange tagging is typically for warring factions. That's kind of like the area that's designated as a war zone uh, for places like that. Yeah, but we, um, depending on where you're at. And then also like due to gentrification, a lot of gang activity is being pushed out of the major major metropo metroplex areas and into smaller locations. So um, like for instance, Tukwila, Tucktown Kings, uh, they recently made the news for a murder, suspected murder of a um, Roland 60s crib in Seattle. So, so. And they have so many different names. You can look them up um, just doing some research. Uh, it's an ever-changing study. It's a fascinating study for somebody who studied sociology in college um, on how that works. But Is there a place to look up like current tagging or anything like that either because i noticed some of that around my neighborhood and then also just at echo but i don't always know what it means yeah uh i mean mostly tagging is seen as just claiming a territory so it's usually going to okay. be their street name that's another thing i do i don't typically use their street name yeah uh, i'll refuse to um so um i just want hey man like come on like let's just you know, I'll call you something, but it's got to be close. Like, I can't go around calling. I can't put you in my phone it's like this. I'm someone's going to take me seriously. Um, but um, most of it is just it's just claiming an area or claiming you've been there for reputation. Um, it is also a large, as I see, a vulnerability because when we put ourselves out, we put so much of our identity into something like that. There was an incident actually pretty recently in Willapa that a kid who very clearly you know, by the way he handled himself and dressed, had no affiliation to any gang or gang culture at all. And he moved into a vacant room. And his task was, I wanted to have a nicer room and cleaned his walls off, which had some gang tagging on it. And some of the guys in the unit took offense to that because they were crossing off the, the prior, prior gang tagging. So that's something that we try to like, that's why we stay on top of that, that behavior and, and turn them towards more pro-social stuff. So even from their own challenging their own thinking errors of he's not trying to be disrespectful. Like, doesn't he have the right to feel comfortable in a clean room with him? Yeah, he does. So I also had a question if there's differences between like gang tagging versus just tagging. I had a student tell me, like, oh, this isn't anything to do with the gang, it's just my street name. 
So I wasn't sure like what's the difference there and like is that like is tagging the same as graffiti? Like what's the terminology and the difference there? No, so tagging is typically comes from um okay, I will say no. So as we move into this digital age and talking about hybrids, and as we've seen through like since the late 80s, early 90s, gang culture has taken a hold in a uh, predominant it's in fashion, it's in music, it's in arts, it's a lot of things. So it might not necessarily be, you know, like the um, on the south side, uh, Serenio Jersey, mm -hmm. that lettering, that font doesn't automatically make it gang related, right? It's just an old English font. Yeah. Um, so I don't assume that everything like that is bad or has no value or is gang related. Um, it's just here at Echo Glen, you know, like if a kid is doing an art project and he's writing his name, his given name in that, I wouldn't think twice about it. Uh, or he's doodling, right? But if it starts to get a little bit more, um, when you start to see numbers involved is a pretty big indication. So that's them, you know, they'll use their area code or their set typically. And that's usually where it kind of leans more towards games. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. I don't know how much your blocks were tearing, so I don't want to like take up too much time. And um, okay. I did want to share there is uh, someone does maintain a Seattle gang territory map. Um, so if you do a Google search, you can find it. It's just a Google map. I can put the link in down here. Um, it's in the chat. The link is in the chat. Um, it's been updated as of December 2021. So it's fairly recent. Um, a good movie to watch if you want to get um, some basic history about how gangs developed historically is Crips and Bloods Made in America. It's a good documentary. And then if you want a watch a movie that I uh, is rated R for violence reasons, um, it, that really talks about the, really puts a, a spotlight on the pressures that uh, families of gang members face. American History X is um, really good. And uh, if you're not in the right headspace, it can be super traumatizing. So. One of my favorites, actually. I actually did a huge paper on it. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, you reminded me of something there, Terry. Um, oh, so the only other thing I would look out for as far as like a mentor, if you're asking your kids to write something, I always push back on it. My initials are NK, Nick Kushner. When I worked in Toodle, um, we had assignments where we had to write, you know, our staff would write their initials to sign off to it. Like this kid did their treatment work with me. And I don't know how many Serenios I ever had or Nortenos, like my initials are NK. Like, nope, that stands for me, Nick Kushner, not Norte Killer or anything else like that. Um, but if you get written work back, a lot of times uh, Crips, they won't like, they, they'll they always spell like F-U-C-C. They won't spell that word with the K in it because C-K is disrespectful Crip Killer. I always push back on that. I was like, this is the environment we're in. I'm asking you to do this for school. It's not for Instagram or TikTok or whatever. So please use actual English. And I think that also sets up precedence for kind of what we were going back for Christian. I think the process, I don't have this experience, but the process of walking yourself out of a gang is going to be kind of slowly backing out of it time by time. And so by giving them like, they'll t say, talk about talking code. So um, the way that they talk or the words they use, the vocabulary they use. It might be norm in the gang amongst other gang members, but it's not typically pro-social in the world, right? If I went and talked to the grocery clerk and was talking that way, probably they would look at me a specific way or I would be flagged a certain way. Um, so uh, kind of like I'll use it as like, hey, man, you need to learn. I need you to show me you can talk code. Like if you're going to get a job, that you're not, you're going to be able to, to speak a certain way or demonstrate certain values so that you don't appear to be like that. So, and it's just those little hooks that we try to get into everywhere we can. So. Can you hear me? Is, is this yes. one? Yes. Oh, great. Hi. 
Thank you. You would think Mercury's in retrograde. Technology is not working for me lately. Things aren't happening. <laughs> My headphones threw me off. Um, but hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming. And thank you so much, Nick, for coming and dedicating time to this. This is um, great. We really appreciate it. So thank you. Um, I uh, just wanted to add in... Um, that there's a movie, a documentary that I'm going to put in the chat. Um, it's called Since I've Been Down, um, which I'm sh sure people have heard of, but it talks about Tacoma, Washington and gang and kind of the, the um, three strikes law in Washington in the early 90s and how all of that developed um, and kind of the movement of gangs from LA up north up to Tacoma and all of that so that there's a website for that but um uh yeah it's from based focused on um someone who grew up in Tacoma and kind of gives a good history as well um so I like that as a resource as well if anyone's interested and the the since I've been down um has become a local movement so you can find um people that are using that movie and conversation groups to transform the justice system because it's a local story and i think you um can pay to rent it or something like that it's like a sundance film festival so it's also like supporting a great cause if you do choose to rent it or um, sometimes there are showings, but I know it came out in 2020. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, they were doing virtual showings, but maybe soon, you know, maybe they'll do some in-person events if they aren't already. All right. I think we are coming to the close of our time. I want to just check in and see if anybody has any more questions. And of course, I think if you if you're like me and you think of all your questions at one o'clock in the morning, then uh, jotting them down and then emailing them at a reasonable hour in the morning would be awesome, <laughs> right? Um, so. I appreciate everybody who came tonight. I want to give a special thanks and gratitude to Nick. Yay. Thank you, Nick. Any Anytime, you guys. I Anything I can do to appreciate what you guys do and the relationships you guys build, um, absolutely supportive of that. So. Thank you. All right, and so I think for the good of all of our souls, we shall end the meeting and go back and do our family, home, all that stuff tonight. Sound good? Yes, right. thank you. All right, thank, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. See you all. Have a good night.